When slacking is brought up, it's synonymous with the ability truant, but what if it didn't have this pesky little ability holding it back? And that's the answer we're seeking in today's cross-generation run. Welcome back to the channel where I do Pokemon solo challenges with the ultimate goal of ranking Pokemon after a series of runs and optimizations. The rules I use for these challenges are in the description if you're interested in that. And if you are a returning subscriber like Baby T, I do appreciate the support, but grab yourself a Sodi Pop because this one has been in the works for a while. Before we get into any details, stats or information about the ROM, I do want to talk about the new moves that I added first. We're going off a of generation 7 base for this one, and let's start with the aptly named Slack Off. Slack Off is simply a recover clone, it's going to heal slacking, but the thematic name, it was just something I felt really belonged in the run, so I just reskinned recover, I gave it a new name. Punishment is next, and for the purposes of this run, it's just a 60 base power dark move. In later games, it has a much more complex effect, but a basic 60 base power move is fine for here. It's not too interesting. At level 14, we will learn Feigned Attack. It's a swift clone that's a dark type rather than a normal type. Uh, nothing too crazy here. Now I want to talk about something exciting, and it's Hammer Arm. It's a 90% accurate 100 base power fighting move with the drawback that it's going to lower your speed by one stage when you use it. If any of you have been following Following me since the Rayquaza run, you know that self debuffing moves is something that I've been working on for quite a while, and that's really the holdup for this video. But with the help of a Discord user named Rainbow Metal Pigeon, I was finally able to get that missing piece of the puzzle, and it's functional now. Hammer Arm, it looks pretty powerful at first glance, but it's really interesting because in the early game, the speed debuff is actually a pretty huge drawback, especially on something like Brock, but we'll kind of get to him in a minute. Outside of that, fighting just is not a great typing in the early game. The amount of poison and bug Pokemon found here means that it's going to be resisted a ton and this leads me to Slacking's biggest problem that it's going to have in the whole game and that's going to be Scratch. Scratch is not a powerful move. Uh, Pokemon could probably have 400 base attack and a 40 base power move it would still leave a little bit to be desired even if it does get stabbed. And you might look at Hammer Arm and you might be thinking, wow Matt you picked the generation that gives something that's going to be great on Brock and it's going to make this Pokemon too easy and too broken and to that I say that you must have not been paying attention. Let me say this, if Groudon with Precipice Blades or Tinkaton with Gigaton Hammer could not one-shot Brock's Pokemon with over 400 effective power, what makes you think for even a second that a non-stab move with over half of the effective power would even stand a chance of one-shotting Brock's Pokemon? Now let's address the easy part. Now it's my opinion that cross-gen runs, they aren't meant to be a difficult challenge. I guess they can be, but for me personally, the intrigue and the interest in making these ROMs is to see the power creep, see how good these Pokemon can be, or see if they just fall a little bit behind. And spoiler alert for other videos, they usually do fall behind, but we'll talk about that soon. Now let's not get too sidetracked because there is a run going on, but the early game's not really as simple as you might think. It's a little bit more complicated than just a simple face roll to the gym. There's a few things that you need to know coming up, and they mainly revolve around Hammer Arm. I just said that it can't one-shot Brock's Pokemon even with some levels, and even then, it's still not a a guaranteed two shot. And you might think that the speed doesn't matter. Just go in there, swing around that hammer arm. No big deal if you go second. You can just knock out the Pokemon, but the real issue is bide. If Onyx uses a bide and you use even a single hammer arm, you are in danger of being knocked out. So it just becomes this roll of the dice that doesn't feel great. It feels very inconsistent. So you might be wondering, what's the solution here? Originally for my first few tests, I was battling the two optional bug catchers, but Scratch, it made it just cost too much time. And what I landed on was ultimately fighting the light years junior trainer just like with brock this fight does have problems in red and blue version if you've seen my yellow runs or streams i blackout grind on this trainer a lot i love doing that but the issue for this run just taking it out naturally without blackout intentions is that sand shrew here has sand attack not only can it just stall the fight for a long time, but it can also make it an unwinnable fight, and you're just sitting there hoping and praying that your 25% accurate moves can hit through the sand. So this is already a concession in the run very early because I did have to restart two times to get this run going, but the prize for this fight is that it perfectly gets you to level eight, and level eight just felt like the perfect blend of speed and consistency. And without dragging on too much in this early game, let's take a look at Brock.
On Geodude, I do not want to lower my speed, so Scratch is weak and resisted, so the default answer here is Punishment. It doesn't do a ton of damage, but it does just enough, and overall it makes this one pretty quick and painless, but a key thing that doing the extra battle earlier here is that I hit level 9, and that puts us at exactly 26 speed going into the Onyx. Now this is only a speed tie, and you do not want to start off with Hammer Arm, and you're going to see immediately why, because it wins the speed tie, it goes for bite immediately. Remember, if it gets hit with a hammer arm when it uses bite, it's pretty much game over. And just to show that off, you might not think that this punishment does a ton of damage, but after I use slack off and waste a turn or two, look at this massive damage that bide does to me, and that's just from punishment. You can just imagine if I used hammer arm. From here, I do play a little cautious. I heal up, and since I'm out of punishment PP, it's time to lay down the hammer. One use, it's going to debuff our speed, make us underspeed the onyx, but I get a good range, plus the damage from punishment earlier. That means we grab the victory, and we get that boulder badge. Now the beginning of the game is over, and I know it kind of drug on just a little bit, but it was really important for me to lay this out for you guys. I did four total slacking runs, and the final touches and what kind of led me to being satisfied with the run was the extra light years battle and how I handled Brock. And I really just kind of wanted to be thorough with it because it's kind of the interesting parts for me. Now we've talked about Hammer Arm being resisted mostly outside of Brock, so it's going to be nothing but scratch from here on out outside of maybe a few Rattatas on Route 3. But now that we have a little time, let's talk about some stats. If I had to describe slacking to someone, I would say that it's a much improved Snorlax that isn't held back by extremely low speed. In fact, slacking has 100 base speed, which is really good, fantastic, but it gets even better when you consider that crit chance is based off of a Pokemon's base speed in Gen 1, so we have a near 20% chance to crit on every single attack that we use. Slacking just has monstrous stats all around, and it does something that's extremely rare. I picked the highest stat between special attack and special defense for the unit Gen 1 special stat in these ROMs and that's pretty much just due to how Chansey was handled from Gen 1 to Gen 2 and appropriately I call this the Chansey rule but this allows slacking to actually have a higher base stat total than Gen 1 Mewtwo which is a pretty insane feat and speaking of Mewtwo if you didn't know Mewtwo is the bar that judges the success of these cross generation runs generation 1 Mewtwo is perhaps the most overpowered iteration of a Pokemon to ever exist and with a final time of 1 hour and 55 minutes in its run, only two Pokemon out of the over a dozen cross-gen runs that I've done have ever climbed that Mewtwo mountain. Now, if you're focused on these cards, you're wondering what's going on, just look at the number at the top. It's a rating from 0 to 100. Now, we'll talk about the details at the end of the video when slacking gets its rank, but it goes without saying that a score over 100 means that these are the only Gen 1 runs that I've done that would be considered like an S tier if you were just going by the bog standard tier list options. And just to throw it out now, since I didn't really want to bloat the intro, let me talk about the ROM for a second. This is a custom ROM made by me. The back sprite is custom, the front sprite is from Sanqui, the color palette is from Pokemon Yellow, and the sprites they are from the Space World 1997 demo. Now if you're curious about playing this for yourself, I do have patch files available for Patreons and channel members, and if you are interested in kind of learning about how to make ROMs for yourself, the Poke Red branches from GitHub I use are in the description, so check that out. Now I wanted to get this out of the way, and if you see anyone in the comments that's asking something that I just answered, Feel free to timestamp this, leave a comment, if I haven't answered, of course. Moving ahead into Mount Moon, I'm on the minimum track, and I do have to dip downstairs to pick up Mega Punch, and this leads to another slacking problem. Mega Punch and Hammer Arm, they are powerful, but that means we have to rely on moves that have less than 100% accuracy. This leaves open that potential for misses and some time loss, but I think compared to the alternative of just using Scratch, the upside is just much higher going this route. Now, I actually choose to replace Scratch in the final run. A tiny little time save for me was to keep Slack off in the move set and not buy any potions from Vermilion. If I took any damage, I would just heal with that in the battle, save some menu time. It felt more efficient just to use Mega Punch exclusively and do that. This leads us to Cerulean at level 14, and I actually go straight to the rival rather than heal first. To avoid PP issues, taking on the rival now, and then after the battle, anchoring myself to the Poke Center, just let me make more cuts. But let's kind of get to the rival battle, and I'll talk about the one singular 
time in the run that faint attack could actually have a use. We've talked about Mega Punch's 85% accuracy, and if you get hit with just a single sand attack, it drops the accuracy to about 56%, and it can make things anywhere from much slower to even threatening a reset. Faint attack being a swift clone means it bypasses accuracy, and it's the backup strategy to avoid that altogether, and it does a good enough job, but here it doesn't come into play, and we're never gonna see faint attack used in this entire run. As for Nugget Bridge, there's a few little tidbits I would like to cover. Something that isn't too relevant for the run is the fact that Hammer Arm does trigger the badge boost glitch when it drops your speed, meaning that it will raise our attack by 12.5% since we have Brock's badge. It doesn't see much play in the run, and I utilize it on little bitty fights like this. I can one shot the Pidgey with a Hammer Arm, and that little badge boost puts Nidoran into a slightly better range. Overall, it really doesn't mean much, but it is an interesting interaction that maybe we'll see in some future run. Next up, I fight the Onyx Hiker rather than the Hiker guarding the Elixir. This is a little bit faster and I don't need the Elixir anyway, but here it manages to barely hang on with a sliver of health. But the sub 100% accuracy is going to start to play a factor on this route. You can see me miss two extra times before I move on, and when we make it to the end of the route, I have exactly three Mega Punches left, and this is not the ideal situation you want to be in. Essentially, I needed to hit three straight Mega Punches without missing, or this run would have pretty much been dead, but thankfully, Slacking clutches it out, and we make it through. Next up is Misty, and there's a simple solution here. There's no need to overthink it. Just go for Mega Punch. Keep it simple. I'd like to quickly talk about the back sprout here, though. It's custom, and what I was going for was like a Muppet that was looking back at you, kind of like cross-eyed, or side-eyed, I guess you would say. I'm very pleased with how it turned out, and I really enjoyed looking at this back sprout. Let me know what you think down below, but we punched some stars here. We get the second badge. Something I haven't covered yet is that we learned Amnesia at level 17. It has absolutely no use yet, but it's in a similar situation to Snorlax where Snorlax started with Amnesia. You can't really utilize it for a long time, but you have this massive attack and you get some really great physical move choices for the run. So it makes kind of like knowing what the right move pool is for the end of the game not so obvious on your first playthrough. Very interesting. Let's flip it on down to the SSN and I think you, you know what time it is. Body Slam, it's already one of the most premier moves in generation one but when you have 160 base attack and you get stab it's just that much better this is the glue that's going to hold slacking together until it transitions into the late game and i can start just kind of throwing up some battles in the background because for a while there's going to be absolutely nothing in the game that can withstand a body slam of this caliber rival number three is a series of one shots and then when we take it over to surge the same thing applies here the fact that slacking has no extra training but it outspeeds and can one shot right you with a non-super effective move is a little bit impressive, but there's no awards or prizes for beating Surge unless you count Thunderbolt, which we are going to use immediately because it's a pretty good prize, let's be real. Let's skip ahead to Celadon, and the mid game is officially upon us, and with Mewtwo's shadow looming over, let's talk about some of the cuts that I made. I'm doing the rocket hideout first, but rather than pick up high money items like nuggets and vitamins, I am going to be skipping them just to save a little time. With hammer arm in play for the run, something like Giovanni definitely isn't a problem like it was in the Pidgeot run, and overall this section, it's incredibly fast, just as you would kind of suspect. From there, I immediately go shop. This is a pretty early buy. The idea is that I really don't need vitamins here. This is why I skipped those high money items in the hideout. So overall, I don't pick up anything extra to sell. There's no extra TMs, no top floor TMs. And this one's only like 20 seconds of real life time to visit. I would like to say that maybe if you're wondering, I didn't pick up Ice Beam here. Just like the Mewtwo run and some other runs, I just don't really see the use of Ice Beam a lot of times. It doesn't really offer you much in return. I think the top floor TMs in general are kind of slow and you're just going to be upgrading it for the much superior Blizzard later anyway. Overall, I do get three calciums and we're just on our way. Now I'm heading over to Pokemon Tower and just like most of the time rival number four is going to be trivial. It's a body slam show. Everything's taken out swiftly. Everybody's running around screaming. It's panic. But today instead I'd rather talk about something after that and it's just kind of another one of those annoyances for slacking. You don't have super effective damage for the Gastlys but with Amnesia you can at least get some turn economy to speed this up on the first channeler. The concept is something I've been preaching for a while but here one Amnesia we'll take this battle down to four total turns counting the ghastly turns and that's down from a total of six turns if you didn't use it at all and I just I really love the efficiency and trimming down turns in the battles it's one of my favorite things in these kind of runs as for the other channelers they only have a 
single ghastly, which means there's no real way to speed this battle up. And you just kind of hope they don't confuse you, but it is fine here. And honestly, not gonna lie to you, it kind of feels good to talk about Pokemon Tower a little bit, but it has worn out its welcome. We can move on. With less than 45 minutes to go to chase Mewtwo, Slacking needs to turn up the heat a little bit, and I'm going to start by going down to the Safari Zone, we're going to pick up those final HMs of the run, and outside of the very important full restore, I do skip everything else. The Carbos and the Protein, they're just a waste of time for our little monkey boy here. Moving it back to Celadon, it's time to take on Erica. I get to actually utilize Hammer Arm one last time, and I held off going here just simply because I didn't have the ranges. Victory Bell's a scary Pokemon, and with Sleep status in play, it felt better just to get that guaranteed one shot but second up we do have the very pathetic Tangela and this is where I'm going to utilize hammer arm just a little bit like we talked about earlier on nugget bridge I can't get the one shot but that's perfect because two badge boosts from the self-induced speed drop will put Vileplume into a guaranteed one shot range whereas it was only like a 60% chance before which means I get to avoid any sleep I get to avoid any time wasting and that always feels pretty good Saffron is next on the list, and I want to talk about something that I don't really mention much in videos, and that's the art of kind of planning center visits and strategic anchoring. I'll explain more, but first, when you give the Sodi Pop to the guard, you can just walk out, and as soon as you hit this spot and the palette changes to denote that you've entered Saffron, this is where you unlock it as a flat point. So you can just stop there, you can select your flyer, you can fly to Saffron. Now, on its own, this is just straight up faster than walking to the Saffron Poke Center if you needed to but it also sets your dig warp point here as well and it kind of sets us up to kind of tackle both Silphco and Sabrina's gym with the absolute minimum time loss as possible. I've done a ton of videos and I doubt anybody's really watched all of them but sometimes I do forget to mention the little things like this but for me personally in my opinion it's stuff like this that kind of really add up to polish off a great run. It's the little things like this that people miss and stuff I would like to teach somebody maybe wanting to do solo runs. I think it can make an average run be good or a good run even be great and hopefully it pays off for this one. As for Sylph, as much as I would love to cut out the 10th floor optional stuff like Alolan Raichu and Alolan Ninetales is able to, Earthquake is just far too valuable. While we do have Amnesia, the only thing it's going to be used for for slaking is ice and electric damage so the ground coverage is critical for late game fights. It also fills the same niche as Hammer Arm so for the most part it's a straight up upgrade and it's a very easy decision to replace it basically as soon as you get it. From there, there's nothing extra, and I think we can go straight to rival number five. We've reached a point in the run where Slaking can really start to snowball, and it's going to be thanks to Amnesia. Alola Ninetales and Raichu really pushed it to its limits with a special boost and move, but it really does allow you to cut out virtually anything extra in the run, on top of giving you supreme turn economy, and that's why those runs turned out the way that they did. Here, strategic use of two Amnesias can turn a pretty long battle into just a 10 turn battle, and that's not really that bad if you consider that I'm only level 33, and I don't outspeed the Alakazam yet but this one was clean and it should sort of set you up to know what to expect coming up. We're not quite skipping over the rest of the Sylph. I do want to show the act of digging out a Sylph, being right back at the Poke Center in town, and then using that just to box straight up to Sabrina. This type of planning is always extremely satisfying when it all comes together, but you know that's going to take us straight to Sabrina. And while this one's going to look pretty clean, pretty easy, this was a bit of a risky play. It was a decision to take some minor risks to maximize the time, and the reason this fight gave me any trouble at all was that I'm not really healing at this point. You notice I'm missing some health and missing some PP in pretty much every battle that I go into and Venomoth of all the Pokemon has a chance to survive a body slam and the computer will always take it even if it's like a 1% chance it'll take it it'll put the paralysis on you and that can make Alexam a bit scary now here I don't really have to worry about it I just get a crit and after taking some pretty low damage from a side wave at the end the risk does pay off we get another badge keeping that pace going straight to Fuchsia Gym. I want to take a slight tangent here. These runs, they're obviously, they're very planned out, they're optimized. I do several playthroughs, I plan out the exact routes, and generally I just know what to do, when to do it, I practice it, 
And I have this intrusive problem that I have to admit to you guys and to myself. There's so many times where I'm just playing the game and I'll get him, I get an idea in my head where I'm like, oh, what if I just did this? Why do what I've already planned? Just do this instead, try it out. And I'll just do it, despite nothing backing it up, no practice, and the fact that I've already tested and planned the route. And I just, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I give in to that little devil on my shoulder and I do it here. The plan was to use all of my rare candies to this point after Koga. This is my fourth playthrough. I've cleaned everything up. This is my final attempt. But I had the bright idea just to use all my candies right now before Koga rather than the tried and tested method I've already done. The important thing here is that the levels will let you get one shots and better ranges and they really just don't matter for Koga. We'll go more into that later. But luckily this kind of little mess up on my experience, this little change up here doesn't matter because slacking is just really powerful. But this is really just a PSA to myself to stop doing this. Just follow the route. Stop trying to change things on the whim like you're some genius or something. It's annoying. As for Koga, my genius on the fly use of candies, it made an already very trivial and easy fight even easier, if that's even possible. This is a series of one shots. We have Earthquake, and I guess we'll sort of talk about why using the candies before Koga was kind of stupid. But first, let's take that brisk swim down to Cinnabar, and something I'll call attention to is that I'm waiting about like 10 steps before I use a super repel. The encounter rate on the water is really low here, so if I can get by without using a repel just for a few seconds here, I can kind of to parlay that into a time save inside a Pokemon Mansion. The rare candies from earlier do ensure that you don't get any wild encounters, and holding off ever so slightly on that repel, it lets you make it all the way to Blizzard without having to menu an extra time to use the repel. I love combining instances of menuing. It may not be interesting to everybody, but it does add some efficiency. I also, I want you guys to take a close look. I want you to remember this part right here because it's going to be important later. Look at how many times I fumble trying to learn Blizzard. This is pure human error. It has nothing to do with slacking. And I wasted around 24 seconds of in-game time here. And I was getting really frustrated because I wanted this run to be good and I was really struggling to get it below two hours. But we'll come back to it. Just remember it. That's all I want you to know. Just remember that. We get Blizzard. Remember this moment. Finally, the reason the candies were a complete waste of time before Koga was that it virtually means that you're wasting all of the Koga experience because I'm going to pick up the two candies here and I'm just going to use them anyway. Again, it doesn't matter too much. Slacking's really strong, but I do want to point it out just for the world to see. Maybe I can correct myself. Maybe we can all be a better person for it. From there, the clock is ticking. I really, I just don't have too much time to really think about if TM28 is actually Doomstoner, brother, or not. And believe it or not, the this running bit is going to be more entertaining than Blaine today. Hard to believe, isn't it? Blaine's usually so good in red and blue. Now, this is just an example of that early candy use making this a simple matter of just earthquaking until everything stops moving. And rather than having to maybe set up an amnesia to get a range or maybe get some extra speed, it just makes this really simple. That was the reason for the candies, this and some other battles. But we can just keep this rolling straight into the final gym. And more of the same is going to apply here. Originally, you needed some ranges from amnesia and you even needed a little bit of speed so that you could save some turns later. But being level 49 here makes this a series of one shots. No setups even required. And we only have one more battle to go before the beginning of the end. And this drops us straight into rival number six, and I'm playing this one pretty risky. I missed a blizzard against Giovanni, so I'm taking a risk. I'm relying on a single blizzard to hit when I need it the most, but overall this one's going to be very similar to rival number five in the fact that this is a 10 turn battle when things go perfect. I do have to set up one additional amnesia, but I can get that turn back since I now outspeed the Alakazam, and this one's clean, but there's only really so many ways that I can say that. This one, it's over. Now my friends, slacking is getting close. We only have around 11 minutes to go for that Mewtwo bar, but this one is gonna be a pretty tight race. To save even more time, I'm gonna be cutting out the Victory Road Rare Candy. There's no more training, and that means it's gonna be straight to the Elite Four. And the only question left is if slacking is gonna run into some trouble or if it's gonna keep up its domination. Lord 
Torla and her Dugong is up first, and two Amnesias is going to be the play here. It's going to set up that Thunderbolt sweep, and I'm going to keep it real with you guys. The Elite Four for this run, it was near magical and how fast and how clean it was. So today I'm going to try something new. I'm actually going to show the unedited footage. I'll speed it up a little bit, slow it down if I need to, but we're going to go through them like little pieces of paper. So when we get done with this one, not healing after Lorelai, it's not the most unique and rare thing in the world considering who's up next, but I'm going to speak positive about Bruno just a little bit this week. I wanted to set up here in this spot for the Machamp ranges because despite the stats and the complete dominance up to this point, a submission from Machamp, it does a lot of damage. If it crits, it would probably be a one shot. And I would rather just take a few seconds, take it a little bit slow here, get that guaranteed one shot range, and just not have to worry about that possibility. Now once again after the fight, I'm just dead sprinting through the door, straight to Agatha, no elixirs, no healing, it's just straight into the fight. Now you guys already know how good Earthquake is on this fight, but I'm going to say this, Golbat, it was the main reason for getting Blizzard this run. It gave me this pretty good range that I was comfortable enough with just to roll the dice, not set up at all for this fight, save me a little time, save some turns. I didn't have to sit there and use Amnesia a couple of times, but it does pay off here, which is great. And just like that, you've watched Slacking just roll through, just pound through the first three Elite Four members, and this one's looking pretty easy. On that walk to Lance, this is where you're going to see me use the one and only Elixir of the Elite Four. Blizzard just doesn't have that much PP, so it just wasn't worth the risk. And as for Lance, you already know at the start, Thunderbolt, it's going to take out the Gyarados 10 times over. I level up, and here I'm going to set up one time for the sole purpose of outspeeding the Aerodactyl. Now, if you think about it, letting Aerodactyl take a turn versus me just using Amnesia, it costs the same amount of turns, but it could use Fly, it could waste even more time, so this is the safer play. But at the end of the day, I have Blizzard for the Dragons, we have Thunderbolt for the other Flyers, and that's the end. You've just seen the unedited run through the Elite Four, which is really cool, but as is tradition, I just can't unedit it to the champion. We have to fade to black, we have to start up that champion theme, and I think it's about time we dig into that final battle. Pidgeot is first, and like we've done several times, I am taking a risk here. I didn't use an elixir. I only have two blizzards, and I need both of them to hit in this fight. But as for this part of the battle, one setup of amnesia, all I need. I let the Thunderbolt loose, and we can move on. Alakazam, no problem. I outspeed it, and I don't think anyone is questioning if a 160 base attack Pokemon with Earthquake is going to one-shot it. It does. And when we get to the Rhydon, I actually need to hit a blizzard here. I got to use blizzard. It has really high defense and the earthquake just isn't a reliable one shot it does hit and that leaves us with one blizzard left for later in the fight you know who it's on after that the thick puppy is weak to earthquake i get the range and we're swiftly just climbing through this battle like we did the rest of the elite four and that's leading us straight to the executor i need this blizzard to hit it does it's looking good but i crit that means the executor survives and a hypnosis here would be devastating it would make the risk not pay off but it just goes for the very pathetic worst move in the game barrage and it's low enough at that point where anything can take it out on my next turn and finally at the end blastoise it's on its knees it's begging for that thunderbolt it's saying please give me the thunderbolt straight to the dome and slacking it finishes off an extremely dominant run really convincingly With a final time of 1 hour, 58 minutes, and 41 seconds, sadly, slacking falls short of the Mewtwo bar, but there's something funny about this time. We're going to go over it in just a second. Slacking gets its card with a final cross-gen rating of 98.08 out of 100, and since the last Alolan Marowak run, I have adjusted and fully updated the cross-gen tier list to reflect the vanilla stuff, but this score right here, it's exactly the same as Groudon. It finished with the same score, the same time, the same resets. It just... It feels kind of right, to be honest. For the tiebreaker, I am going to give the nod to slacking. Why am I doing that? Remember earlier that horrible 24 second time loss? Human error. I was just fumbling around, brain turning to mush. I couldn't learn Blizzard. Wasted like 24 seconds. And in all of good consciousness here, I can't hold that against slacking. I'm not going to adjust slacking's time for that, but I'm just going to give it the tiebreaker due to that. It makes sense. If you don't like it, let me know. So if we look at this full tier list, you can see that slacking tops all the other Gen 3 box art legendaries. And that alone is a pretty impressive feat. You got Groudon, Rayquaza, Kyogre, 
but slacking sits in front of them. Third overall, nothing to be ashamed about. Pretty good position. And I'm gonna say here at the end of the video, if you actually wanna know like the math and the reasoning behind the tier list rankings and scores, I do have an unlisted video in the description, but that's gonna do it for this one. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. I do appreciate the support, and if you're still listening to this video right now, you already know, you're a real one. And I would appreciate it if you comment that down below because I love to see it. And I guess that's it, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.